Monument Valley, Niagara Falls, awe-inspiring testament to how our planet has been shaped over millions of years. But there is one strange landscape where things are different. If what's been discovered here is true, it could rewrite our understanding of how the planet was formed. This is the story of how the greatest flood of all time could carve out a landscape in the blink of an eye. Washington State, in the northwest corner of the United States. After miles and miles of peaceful, flat farmland, suddenly, out of nowhere, the scablands erupt. Gorges, some almost 1,000 feet deep. A waterfall that dwarfs Niagara Falls, but has no water. Weird holes in the valley floors. Strange layered deposits. And over the whole area, boulders are scattered as if a giant had dropped them there. The Scablands. Few places on Earth have stirred such mystery and controversy. And it lies just 200 miles east of Seattle. For almost a century, scientists have been struggling to discover what forces could have shaped this landscape. But try as they might, for decades they were unable to explain it. There was one landscape that really defied the understanding of geologists. And of course, that landscape was the channeled scab land. Then, a new idea came to light, which may finally explain the bizarre landscape of the scab lands. If the scientists are right, then the scab lands was created in a vast, cataclysmic disaster. One involving terrifying forces, which exploded, scoured, and ripped the surface of the planet. And all this came about from the study of rocks. In geology, we are really looking for evidence for features in the rocks, on the landscape. It's very similar to what a detective does, looking for clues at a crime scene. And those clues are fit into a pattern, and ultimately a culprit is associated with that crime scene. Even the first explorers and the first settlers who came in this area recognized this as a truly remarkable topography and they realized that this was something like the Earth having been uh, subjected to wounds and sores. So they called this uh, scab land. But uh, you can't really get a sense of the scale of this unless you, you get out onto the landscape uh, yourself.
For a long time, it was assumed that the Scablands features would have taken millions of years to create. One of the ways this could have been done is by the gradual erosion of rivers. There are rivers and lakes in the Scablands today, but none of them could have sculpted this landscape. This water is part of modern irrigation schemes and was not here when the Scablands were created. The only river big enough and old enough to do it is the Columbia, which is 50 miles away. But there is no evidence it ever eroded the features of the Scablands. There was another reason why rivers couldn't have created the Scablands. No river in the world can form what you are about to see. You will not find these anywhere else on the Earth. These enormous potholes are one of the strangest geological features on the planet. If I was on the bottom of a big river like the Columbia, I might find some potholes that were maybe a few feet across, a few feet deep. But this feature, this rock basin, of which there are hundreds in the channeled scab land, is about 10 times as big as the potholes that we find in even a large river like the Columbia. It's very clear just from the size of the feature that this was not made by normal river processes. The revelation that this landscape was not formed by rivers made this area even more compelling to geologists. But there were other features that suggested another possible culprit. This 100-ton boulder doesn't look strange until you ask yourself how it could have got dumped on the edge of this 1,000-foot precipice. It's made of granite, but granite is not native to the Scablands. Boulders like this one are scattered erratically all over the area, and indeed are known as erratics. It was thought there was only one force on Earth that could have put this boulder up here. And it is not a river. It is something else. Ice. It can carve through solid rock and can even build mountains. During the last ice age, massive sheets of slow-moving ice called glaciers pushed gradually down from Canada towards the Scablands. Glaciers move down valleys, carving out new landscapes as they go. They do this by ripping up rock from the valley floor. And this is how erratics are made. They then travel within the ice, sometimes for hundreds of miles, until being dumped when the ice melts. Surely, erratics are the clues left by glaciers that came through here and carved out these canyons. Yet again, 
it looked as if the culprit had been found. Glaciers, it seemed, must have created the scablands. But there was a problem. The ice sheets that traveled down from Canada during the last ice age stopped short of the scablands. So geology is two main theories to explain the gradual formation of this landscape just didn't work. River erosion could not explain these potholes and ice was too remote from the scablands to create these classic glacial features. Geologists, it seemed, were back where they had started. Each time they'd attempted to explain the riddle of this tantalizing landscape, they'd failed. There was, however, one last theory that claimed to offer an answer. Unfortunately, it struck those who first heard it as completely insane. During the 1920s, a geologist called J. Harlan Bretz outlined a theory of what he thought had really happened to the scablands. But Bretz's theory defied all scientific convention. He claimed the scablands were not the result of millions of years of geological evolution, but of an enormous catastrophe that had happened almost overnight. Throughout the 1920s, Bretz traveled the scablands examining the landscape. But of all the features he encountered, there was one that really set him thinking. From ground level, these shapes didn't seem to make much sense. Bretz must have walked over thousands of those things, but they're so big in the field he had no idea what they were. He just uh, he, didn't, he didn't guess what they were. But everything changed when Bretz tried to imagine them from the air. From up here, these shapes in the ground begin to look like ripples. Ripples left by something as large as an ocean. For years, Brett studied the geology of the Scablands in detail until he reached an astonishing conclusion. A vast body of water had flowed through the once flat Scablands plateau and created the whole landscape in one giant flood. But by the 1920s, Geologists knew the world was millions of years old and so believed that landscapes such as the Scablands must have been gradually formed over very long periods of time. Bretz was challenging this orthodox view. Since the 1820s, geologists had come to think on good evidence that land form, most landforms and most deposits on Earth had formed over long periods of time by ordinary processes of rivers and ocean waves and what have you. Bretz comes and offers this immense catastrophe, altering the landscape essentially overnight. And it was just didn't square with the way geology had been put together at the time. On the 12th of January, 1927, Bretz prepared to address a specially convened meeting of fellow scientists in Washington, D.C. This was his big chance to sell his outlandish theory. The 423rd meeting of the Geological Society of Washington is now called to order. Bretz was proposing something completely unheard of. 
a body of water 800 feet deep, raging through the scablands and then flowing off into the Pacific Ocean. Over 500 cubic miles of water, great flow depths. Now, no gradual process is responsible for this landscape. I am forced by the field evidence, by what I have observed with my own eyes, to come to this hypothesis. It is clear from my field evidence that the Columbia River, swollen inside, could easily have cut dry falls and deposited the gravel fan at Quincy. To any self-respecting geologist, this sounded too much like a biblical flood. They dismissed him out of hand. This did not happen overnight, but over many thousands of years. To suggest otherwise is ludicrous. The implication was very clearly that Bretz was committing a kind of heresy and that he should listen to these elder statesmen of the science and rethink his uh, hypothesis. Even if you were convinced by his unbelievable idea, Bretz still had a problem. Where did the water come from? And Bretz can't tell them where the water came from. It's one of the big problems with, with the whole idea. To convince the world, Bretz needed a source. But how could so much water, traveling at ferocious speeds, suddenly appear out of thin air in eastern Washington? Not one geologist gathered in Washington that day could imagine a source for this heretical flood. Well, not quite no one. Sitting in the audience is J.T. Pardee. Uh, Pardee supposedly leans over to a colleague and says, I know where Brett's water came from. That's this formation. But it would be 15 years before he revealed his secret. During all those years, Bretz remained firmly in the geological wilderness. For Bretz, it seemed to be all over. But his theory would eventually return to take the world of geology by storm. This is Missoula, Montana. It lies 250 miles east of the Scablands. Few who live here would ever suspect that this peaceful place was once the center of an epic confrontation between water and ice. The sheer scale of this confrontation is hard to imagine and the only evidence of its true extent lies scattered on hillsides for miles around. For a long time, no one could work out what made these marks. It was only when geologists discovered some scrapings on a rock that an unexpected idea began to suggest itself. These marks, scratches as it were, on the bedrock represent the erosion of a large glacier that moved into this valley. The suggestion that a glacier had passed by here gave rise to the astonishing theory that as it moved through this valley, the glacier dammed a river and created a lake. These watermarks were formed by the shoreline of this lake, splashing against the side of these hills. This glacier was just a part of the ice sheet that spread from Canada during the last ice age. Looking at a larger scale, the ice moved down the valley from Canada and filled this whole valley from one side to another. It ran into the mountain in front of us and thus blocked the river valley off to the left. The river that ran through this valley was confronted with a wall of ice that was a mile high and an amazing 23 miles thick. Prevented from following its usual path, the river began to back up and fill the valley with water. 
A lake of river water grew behind this wall of ice that eventually became as big as Lakes Erie and Ontario combined. This lake made these watermarks. And if it was still here today, it would drown Missoula, Montana in well over 3,000 feet of water. The water which gushed into the vast area behind the ice was awesome in volume. All this just a small part of over 500 cubic miles of water that became known to geologists as Glacial Lake Missoula. So what does this lake have to tell us about the Scablands 250 miles from here? This whole valley was once at the very bottom of the huge glacial lake. It was here in this valley that Joseph T. Pardee, a man who didn't speak out at Bretz's meeting, discovered something. He knew from the watermarks that there was once a massive amount of water here. But there was no evidence that it had ever moved from this place until he noticed these. Those are huge ripples, like ripples on the floor, floor of a stream. But here, instead of being inches high, they're 10, 20, 30, 40 feet high and spaced 200, 300 feet apart. They're enormous. It was when he saw these giant ripples that Pardee came up with his own extraordinary theory. He said that Lake Missoula had somehow emptied out of this valley. As it moved, the lake water pushed up the gravel on the valley floor to create these giant ripples. Above all, there was something else about the ripples that Pardee noticed. They seemed to point straight towards the Scablands. Here is a huge body of water and it's discharged in a fantastic rate, headed right towards Bertha's Channel Scabland. Pardee's discovery of the ripples was crucial. At last, he'd come up with a possible source for Bretz's giant flood. But there was one question he and his colleagues couldn't answer. What caused the lake to empty in the first place? The answer would eventually come from 3,000 miles away, in one of the most extraordinary environments on the planet. This is Iceland. One of the world's most geologically active land masses. Constantly rocked by earthquakes and volcanic activity. This island on the northwestern tip of Europe is home to strange lava filled landscapes. And it also has more glaciers than the rest of continental Europe put together. It is work like that of Matthew Roberts's examining glaciers for the Icelandic Meteorological Office that has cast a whole new light on glacial Lake Missoula and its disappearing water. What you are looking at now is something truly awesome. This is a modern day wall of ice. It is the snout of a glacier, which is very similar to the glacier that created Lake Missoula over 15,000 years ago. This glacier is massive. It's about 300 feet thick. 
but that's tiny in comparison to the glacier that formed Glacier Lake Missoula, which was at least 10 times thicker. In this example here, the ice has flowed across the valley to the other side, forming a plug. This is exactly the same setting as what would have occurred at Glacier Lake Missoula. When glacial ice blocks the flow of a river and the water builds up behind the ice, scientists call this an ice dam. From work here in Iceland, Matthew Roberts hopes to shed new light on an extraordinary explanation of how glacial Lake Missoula emptied. It is all to do with what goes on deep inside these enormous mountains of ice. The theories are based on data from seismometers, which can monitor tiny movements, and cracks opening hundreds of feet below the surface of the glacier. These cracks signify that the glacier is behaving in a brittle manner, that the ice is fracturing. Just like the fractures that we see behind us here, these crevasses have opened up due to stresses inside the ice and the crack is heard by the seismometers. Matthew Roberts and his colleagues are driven to do this work not by an interest in Lake Missoula, but by an urgent need to understand disasters that happen on their very own doorstep. In 1996, a wall of water cascaded through southern Iceland, causing incredible devastation. All this was the result of an ice dam collapsing. After years analyzing floods like these, scientists eventually worked out the process which caused the dam to fail. Normally, water freezes at zero degrees centigrade and forms ice. But deep at the base of an ice dam, the sheer amount of pressure stops the water molecules from expanding. If they cannot expand, then the water cannot freeze. This results in what is known as supercooled water, which can stay liquid at several degrees below freezing. Then this highly pressurized supercooled water is forced into any tiny crack in the ice. It's the last thing you expect water to be able to do, force its way into ice. But water under this much pressure behaves in some very unexpected ways. This is the first small step in a chain of events that can end in cataclysm. Once supercooled water has begun to trickle through these cracks, the flowing water alone is enough to trigger a very peculiar process. The moving water creates tiny amounts of friction. This friction releases energy in the form of heat. As the water moves through the glacier, it melts the ice. Soon, minute cracks can become giant ones, tens of feet across. 
more water can escape, the tunnel enlarges very quickly, but then suddenly the dam would have failed and bang, the whole dam would have collapsed and a massive wall of water, kilometers wide, would have swept down valley. This mechanism caused the 1996 flood and experts now believe it may be responsible for what happened at Glacial Lake Missoula. A mile-high wall of ice suddenly collapsing, allowing an entire lake to empty. With these new findings, we can now chart the process by which Glacial Lake Missoula emptied and sent two and a half trillion tons of water, that's nearly half of Lake Michigan, rushing across the American Northwest. First, river water over years built up behind the ice dam. Then, as the water reached depths of several thousand feet, the pressure built up, forcing the supercooled molecules into cracks at the base of the glacial Lake Missoula ice dam. The minute trickle of supercooled water quickly hollowed out a series of tunnels in the ice, which fatally destabilized the whole structure. Then, as the sheer weight of water became too much, the ice dam literally exploded. Leaving a gaping hole a mile wide through which an ocean of lake water erupted. You would heard this tremendous roar coming long before you saw anything. The earth would have shook. Imagine the loudest noise you've ever heard. Multiply that by a thousand times. The sheer speed and volume of this incredible mass of water churned up these huge ripples and left behind watermarks as the only remaining record of its vast size. This one cataclysmic event sent trillions of gallons of water at ferocious speeds towards an unsuspecting scablands. But could this giant single body of water really have created the extraordinary features in the scablands? How could this rushing mass of water create canyons, which looked like they were eroded over millions of years? Like this one, 20 times the size of Niagara Falls, known as Dry Falls. How could it carry all these erratics, which are normally deposited by glaciers over thousands of years? And how could it carve out all these strange potholes which are like those in the bed of a river, but on a monumental scale. To test whether a single body of water from Lake Missoula could really have done this, scientists have built their own mini scablands. The Earth's surface dynamics team at St. Anthony Falls Laboratory constructed a scale model of the scablands and then poured water over it to represent the failure of glacial Lake Missoula. Here it comes. What quickly becomes visible is the way in which the water does not just disperse over a wide area, it gouges out these channels, which are then quickly eroded by the rushing water into extraordinary shapes. It is only when the water is turned off that the significance of these shapes becomes clear.
For years, scientists argued that the features of the scablands could not have been formed overnight. But here in this model, you can clearly see miniature versions of scablands canyons. Just like the real ones, they looked like they were slowly eroded. In fact, they were created in seconds. But can the scientists also explain how these strange potholes were made? Using this water tunnel, the scientists can study the effects of water moving at high speeds. They place an object in the tunnel to represent a hard outcrop of rock. At first, just as in the scablands, the water flows round the object without any damage. But then they turn up the speed. Now, a stream of minute bubbles appears. In the tank, the bubbles are too small to see clearly. But as the flow hits the object with increasing speed, the pressure changes that result rapidly create bubbles that collapse with immense force. And as the speed of water increases further, these bubbles collapse with ever greater intensity. You can see it here slowed down nearly a hundred times as a long twisting thread emerging from the metal object. It is in this high-speed vortex of bubbles that the secret to the flood's incredible power lies. So if you, if you look at this, the first thing we see here is this very strong uh, vortex here. So you got like a sledgehammer effect. Every time one of these forms and collapses, bang, you got a sledgehammer. So could bubbles really gouge holes out of solid rock? With this experiment, we can find out. At first, it may not look like much, but just look at it again. This time slowed down 80 times. What you are seeing now is solid rock being exploded by the power of bubbles. But what would this have looked like during the flood? As the flow of water from Lake Missoula surged through the scablands, it would have hit some hard outcrops of rock, creating a vortex of bubbles. Within seconds, these bubbles would explode the rock with all the force of dynamite to create these huge potholes. So now it does seem that a single giant body of water really could have created these features of the scablands. With this last mystery solved, it is now possible to show the incredible events that took place on that fateful day 15,000 years ago. The immense pressure of supercooled water fatally destabilized the ice dam at Glacial Lake Missoula. Then massive chunks of ice within the dam began to fall into the raging torrent until the whole dam just gave way. The collapse of the ice dam released a sea of water. This water then traveled at up to 66 miles an hour across four states rushing headlong towards the scablands. It took only a few hours for the waters to reach this once flat landscape. The water at this point was a staggering 800 feet deep. As this awesome mass flowed ever more quickly, it gouged out miles of canyon. This volatile torrent cut out an ever deeper cliff until it created the massive canyon that is known today as Dry Falls. Further down the flow, huge submarine tornadoes 
Vortices like those seen in the lab were blasting hundreds of potholes by sucking up sections of rock and exploding deep into the bedrock below. Ice from the ruptured ice dam contained within it massive rocks. The flood water carried these rocks huge distances. As the flood waters began to slow, they dumped them all over the landscape, leaving giant boulders dotted over the scablands. After a tumultuous journey, this muddy torrent streamed out to sea, powering along the floor of the Pacific until it came grinding to a halt, over a thousand miles from its point of origin. It had only taken a few hours to get there. Eighty years ago, J. Harlan Bretz shocked the geological establishment with an idea that was seen as heresy. But over the years, more and more scientists gradually began to accept his theory. Oh, I think Bretz was absolutely delighted to see the vindication of his ideas. I think it all culminated in 1980 when he received the highest medal of the Geological Society of America, the Penrose Medal, which was the final and ultimate uh, recognition that he, in his catastrophic flood hypothesis, had uh, generated one of the great ideas in the earth sciences. It was left to later generations of geologists to work out the details of how the giant flood had happened. Their research not only confirmed Bretz's outrageous hypothesis, but has recently revealed that if anything, Bretz was not outrageous enough, for there may have been more than one giant flood. The final twist in the tale centers on one of the classic features of the Scablands, which has long intrigued geologists. This canyon with its many layered deposits. Richard Waite has been studying these deposits for over 20 years. It was assumed that these layers were formed by changes in the speed of one giant flood, known as pulses. But that was before he discovered something odd a white line within the sediments. This is what caught my eye first time down in the canyon. It's an ash layer from Mount St. Helens. We've analyzed it. Um, once you become familiar with these ash layers, they become old friends, so I knew what this was. It's an ash layer from Mount St. Helens. It's about 15,000 years old. Mount St. Helens in Washington state erupts regularly. The ash from the eruption can spread over thousands of miles, as it did when it erupted around 15,000 years ago, near the time of the Scablands flood. At first, it was thought the ash had just fallen in the water and had sunk down into these layers. But could a layer of ash really sink through hundreds of feet of turbulent flood water to form this amazingly neat, clear line. This whole column would be full of mud and sand and silt, and to have something settle through it and come out like this is impossible. This suggested something apparently inexplicable, that the sediments weren't all laid down during one giant flood. It's clear evidence that periodically during the accumulation of this sediment that there had to been dry land. The only rational explanation that anyone has been able to come up with is that there must have been more than one giant flood, perhaps many. 
After one super flood swept through the scablands, the floodwaters drained and there was a period when the land was dry. It was then the ash fell, before another super flood hit scablands and laid more deposits on top. Through forensic detective work like that of Kathleen Nicholl, we are solving this next great mystery. How many floods took place here? And how frequently? This is a really thick sequence of rocks. And by looking at the age of the bottommost unit that we can sample, and then the topmost unit, we'll be able to see if it's one great big flood that stacked up a lot of sediment, or whether it was a series of floods coming in every few years, perhaps, over many thousands of years. It will be years before Kathleen has dated every layer. But by the beginning of 2005, she had reported her first results. The dates above and below the ash are as much as 20,000 years apart. We thought that there was just one flood. But now, with these results, we can say with certainty that this area has been repeatedly hit by cataclysmic mega floods again and again. With these latest results, the culmination of almost a century of geological investigation, it now seems these giant floods were a regular feature of this landscape. Evidence of a phenomenon once seen as outrageous that was in truth a recurring part of this area's history. Not only has the mystery of the Scablands yielded such a surprising and dramatic discovery, but it has changed the way that geologists understand how our planet's landscapes are shaped.